The first person to ever record sound was Edward Lee and Scott de Martinville. He was this French inventor in 1860. He was inspired by early photography. And he said, well, if Daguerre can put a picture on paper, I should be able to put sound on paper. So the way it worked was he had a cylinder that he cranked, and he had a sheet of paper that was covered in soot. And he had a horn and a diaphragm and a pig's bristle that was arranged so that when someone spoke and the diaphragm moved, it would draw a corresponding line into the soot. So in 2007, there was this group of audio historians called First Sounds. They figured out where these things were, and they went over to France, and they got access to them. The images of the white line in the black soot are very similar to the kind of images that we process with Irene when we scan discs. They asked us to collaborate with them on actually extracting the sound from these tracings, and it was the earliest recognizable recording of a human voice. I've been at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab for 30 years, and uh, all through my career here, I've continued to work in experimental particle physics. The first large project that I was involved in was at Fermilab, and it was called a collider detector. And in that experiment, we observed a new kind of matter called the top quark. And then in 1995, a lot of us joined this very big project called ATLAS, which is at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which in 2012 observed the Higgs particle. In order to do those experiments, we need very sophisticated detectors. They're essentially cameras that allow us to image the patterns of radiation that come out in these collisions, and by studying those patterns, we learn about what's going on. And it's sort of like if you smash two garbage pails together and you look at all the debris, and you trace it all back, you can figure out you know, who had eggs and who had bacon. Back in 2000, we were building the Atlas detector, and we were working with a lot of imaging methods and other tools in the lab that just ena enabled us to build the things we needed to build. And I heard a report on KQED, which was about the Library of Congress, the state of its collections of sound recordings, and it was a discussion with Mickey Hart, who's a percussionist, and he's also very much an ethnomusicologist and a champion of historic sound recording and basically a spokesperson for how important these cultural resources are. Listening to it, I was just struck that this sounded like a problem. The problem was delicate, damaged, legacy materials. You don't want to touch them anymore. You know, all this information is encoded in them. How do we get access to it without damaging them further? And I just thought, well, if we could turn these objects into pictures, the same way we turn the patterns of radiation, if you like, into pictures, maybe we could analyze the pictures and extract all the information. So the question immediately was like, can you get a picture with sufficient detail that it becomes a proxy for the physical object itself? This is the cylinder. So this is not a wax cylinder, it's actually a molded cylinder that would have been made for commercial sale, but the original would have been wax. There's a groove that goes around like a spring shape, like a helix, and the sound is stored in the up and down movement of the groove. So when you play one of these things, you'd put a needle down on it, and the needle would follow the groove, move up and down, push a diaphragm, which would push the air, and you'd hear it. This is a disc record. It's a commercially pressed 78 RPM disc. It was issued by Columbia. This was probably from the 1940s. Here there's a groove that goes around like a spiral. And instead of going up and down, the groove moves from side to side. So this we call a lateral recording, and this we call a vertical recording. In the case of the cylinder, where the sound is encoded in the third dimension, we use this device, which is called the confocal microscope. And it creates an image of the entire surface that's like a topographic image. On the other hand, for the disk, in which there's a groove that moves from side to side, we could scan it with three dimensions, and we sometimes do, but we also have this 
which is a type of camera, a regular microphotography camera, that takes pictures. All of this is then going to be processed by a computer, which has an algorithm that enables the sound to be rendered, and this is the result.